This is episode six of Better Things with Joe Bianca. Later in the show, we're going to be handicapping the Flower Bowl and the Jockey Club Gold Cup this Saturday at Saratoga. Both are Breeders' Cup Challenge winning your in races. That Breeders' Cup sponsored segment, we got a $558 profit still from two weeks ago. So we'll see if we can build on that. But first, we're going to talk to CJ Johnson, who's one of my favorite people to talk to in the industry. He's a smart young guy who pioneered one of the biggest turnarounds of a racetrack in racing history, I think. He joined Kentucky Down as an executive in 2012 and built that track from kind of a forgotten meet that just was in the shadows of the Saratoga and Del Mar meets into now one of the marquee race meets in America. It's only seven days, but they attract big fields, great turf racing, low takeout, great for the betters, and this is better things. So it's definitely something that you should pay attention to. CJ was integral in the turnaround of that track, and he's also a really smart guy and a funny guy and just easy to talk to. We had a great conversation about all things betting, sports, even a little hip hop. So check out our interview with CJ Johnson. Welcome back to Better Things. I'm so excited for this next guest. He's an excellent handicapper. He's qualified for the NHC, the BCBC. Used to be an executive at Kentucky Downs, and we've seen what those, the fruits of those labor are. And now he's the vice president of his, his CJ Thoroughbred. CJ Johnson, thanks so much for coming on. No problem. Thanks for having me. Great to have you. I mean, there's so much I want to get into with you. You've been a fascinating guy to me for a little bit now. But this show's called Better Things. So let's start by talking about your handicapping background. Like, where did you first fall in love with racing and when did you get the horse player bug? Well, I was, let's see, I was born in Shreveport, Louisiana. My dad worked at Louisiana Downs. And uh, honestly, I've got pictures of me at about probably four or five with a DRF, like hanging out in the announcer's booth at Louisiana Downs. Um, and I remember he used to give me $20 a day when we go to the races. I bet $2 per race. That was all, you know, I'm, I'm a little kid running around. And uh, so then it evolved from there a little bit, um, obviously growing up around the track. And I uh, basically, I went in college, I, I went to the University of Arizona for a year and a half, was in the racetrack industry program transferred back uh in state to texas because we were living um in the dallas area so i went to texas tech and i kind of i call it my dark days of racing but that was like early 2000s i didn't follow it you know because i was i was around in my whole life burnt out a little bit blah 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 and and i'd say late probably like 2008 2009 it just like sucked me right back in and i i that's when i really started you know, I already knew a lot about how to read a form and betting and all that kind of stuff, but um, I started playing a lot of contests then. And also, my dad was big into contests back then, too. He would always go play that Del Mar, the big Del Mar contest, and he started qualifying for the NHC. So I was like, man, I'm, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And um, I think I, uh, I qualified for the NHC um, and then qualified for the BCBC at Keeneland. Um, and kind of from there, like, 2010 on, I started really working on my, you know, my pick fours, pick fives and, and exotic wagering. Um, and so that it just kind of, you know, that part's always been with me. I'll always be a gambler first. I mean, and, and you know, being at Kentucky Downs, that background really helped me and, and kind of make it a better place for horse players. That's so true. And I, you know, I want to talk so much about that. And it's really one of the remarkable success stories, I think, of the 21st century in racing is, is you started at Kentucky Downs in 2012. And it was, I mean, you can tell me what it was like back then, but but now it has grown into the most horse player friendly product, I think, in America. Huge fields. Obviously, the purses are gigantic. Can you just talk about what it was like when you first started there compared to when, when you left? Yeah, it, um, it, and again, my father being, a you know, loving to place bets and that kind of stuff, it really helped because he understands, you know, that's what drives this game. I mean, we're nothing without handle and he instilled in me early on when I was at Arizona, like how important takeout is and that kind of stuff and having a, you know, a nice wagering product. Um, and so we kind of revamped the wagering menu when I got in there. Um, and I helped out kind of before I officially took over, he would come to me because he knew, you know, I could, I, uh, I understood these things and we kind of worked on it. And then, um, you know, long story short in 2012, the, uh, past GM resigned kind of, with a month before the meet and I basically was asked to just come in and handle it all. But anyways, it was, it was fun because, you know, we, um, not only lowered the takeouts and, and look, I know historical horse racing helped those fields, you know, those field sizes to be very competitive and, and make it a great product. 
but I don't think the handle would have jumped like it did if we kept the normal takeout rates. And, you know, we, we kind of worked on some new wagers. We did the Jockey 7 for a little while. That was fun. Um, you know, a new management decided not to go on with it, but we were, you know, that was kind of more of a, a wager for the newbies that maybe not the newbies, but there's still people that just love to bet on their jockey. Right. I mean, and it was, uh, it was a way to kind of, you know, people to get involved over seven races and, and, and have fun kind of betting on that human element of it all. Well, um, you know, that we did it two years and it handled jumped 50% in the two years, you know? So, um, stuff like that though, it was, it was a lot of fun getting to do that. And, and, and I'm glad, you know, the new, owners and management didn't really mess with the wagering menu because I think that was part of the thing that makes it so great. Well, how much of, how much of a challenge was it? Because I, one of the things that's so impressive about Kentucky Downs success to me is that you're going out right against the end of the Saratoga and Delmar meets. It's not as if you're running in some place on the calendar where there's nothing else going on. So how much of a struggle was it and what kind of things did you guys do to attract attention that normally maybe go into those, those quote unquote bigger meets? Yeah, I mean, look, that was always a problem was quality, right? Uh, you're all of those top tier horses were pointing at you know the end of Saratoga, and so what we really tried to do was we would get with Keeneland and say, all right, let's see your stake schedule. We want to run preps for these, and you know some of those guys maybe maybe it was a loaded field at Saratoga or whatever they'd skip that and come down to us, and that was when the quality was still kind of you know, working its way up. Now I look at the overnights and Chad Brown's got a bunch in, you know, and we could never get him to come down. And I understand it because you're based in New York. You've got these really nice turf horses. Why, you know, as we all know, shipping a horse is not easy. And and coming from New York, it's one thing when you're in Kentucky, you know, we can keep those Kentucky guys around. But when you're in New York and you're Chad Brown and you've got, you know, you're going to be running this horse that's, you know, even money, that's, that's, and it's a, you never know if the horse is going to take to the track, you know. So we we really tried to get those guys, and kind of one by one, they started trickling down from New York. I mean, because you know the the turf racing in Kentucky is great, and it's obviously grown. But you know, during these summer times, um, you know, Saratoga is a spot to run, you know, really nice turf horses. And then and then also we had you know horses shipping in from Delmar. Um, they kind of started seeing what was going on, and uh, you know, I remember a couple of those guys were coming out, and so it, um, you know, it was just kind of you got to take care of them, honestly. And it's tough because logistically they got, they got to have their help down there. And when we don't have a full backside with dorms and all that kind of stuff, like, you know, we would make arrangements with them and, and say, look, all right, you know, we'll help you out here. We'll, you know, we can find you, you know, groom here, whatever here. And, um, you just kind of had to listen to them and make accommodations for them. I mean, it's, it's a pain, but it is what it is. And if you really want to make that place work, you have to do that. Well, there's no more question about Kentucky Downs because I think the press, the presentation has gotten so much better too. It used to be really hard to watch those rough. races, and I think you guys did a great job in terms of HD cameras and having different angles and all that. Yeah, you talk, and you mentioned not having like a full backstretch with dorms and everything. Like, what are some of the the other logistical challenges that you guys had from it being such a unique track? Yeah, so in 2012, we were still pretty small. Uh, our handle was okay, you know, but it was, it was, um, the on track crowd wasn't what it is now. You know what I'm saying? And, and a lot of your revenue comes from on track, either wagering, hot dog sales, beer sales, you know what I'm saying? All that kind of stuff, right? And so when you're not drawing that many people on track because you're kind of newish, I mean, I know they've been around for a while, but it wasn't on the map for anyone. You know, it wasn't that destination spot. And so it was tough because, like, I went in and I had to do literally everything from, starting gates, uh, ambulances, horse ambulance, outriders, racing office staff, you know what I'm saying? Um, tampers for the turf course, uh, mutual clerks. I was like putting everything together and it was so much. I, I, I mean, a, it's like my first, you know, real gig running a racetrack operationally. And, and it was just like, I get in there and I got a month to put it all together and it was insane. And so, then once we started growing on track, it was like, all right, we kind of got more revenue. And it was like, I got help finally. And so someone could take, you know, we had someone working on the backside and doing this and doing that. And so I was able to kind of focus on just wagering and TV. And but, you know, what people don't realize is when you run five days over two weeks, you're um, I still have to rent those starting gates for two weeks. It's not like I'm not paying per day. You know, I mean, I'm not paying per race day. I'm paying per day. You know what I'm saying? So it's real hard to make that money and get that revenue in. And 
I mean, look, it's a business, man. Like, you know, I go say, hey, we need to, we need to add HD. We need to do these, you know, this for our production. And it's like, well, can't afford that right now. Like, let's just get through. And people think, oh my God, they got a hundred thousand dollar made in special weights. Put that money into your cameras. Well, you have a deal with the horseman. It doesn't work like that. Like that money's got to go to purses, you know? And, um, so, I mean, getting a new inside rail, all that kind of stuff's got to come out of your bottom line. And people just don't really understand that. And so I'd be on Twitter and people just, I mean, bitching nonstop at me, you know, and I'm like, man, Better. trust me, I'm trying. And the towers in the first place weren't in the right spots at all. You know, I mean, it was, it was an absolute nightmare. And so it was kind of like a year by year thing. You know, I try to go, all right, I got the pan camera HD next year. I'm gonna try to add two more HD cameras and then, you know, that kind of stuff. And so it was little by little. But now the new the new owners and, and uh, new management they're putting a lot of money into it and I and I think it's gotten a lot better you know since I left and and good because I, I'll admit it was tough to follow man I mean yeah well and listen you laid the groundwork for the success that it's having now like how much pride do you feel and how much of a marquee meet that's become because you know you really were you really were building that yeah it's I I do have a lot of pride and and you know the people who were friends with me then know what I went through um, I mean I was. I lived out there for a while, and then when my wife and I just start, uh, decided to start having more kids, we wanted to move closer to the family back to the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and so I would go out there and basically live in a hotel for a month. You know what I'm saying? I'd have to be away from home, and and just and it was like 12-hour work days, but it was you took I took a lot of pride in it, and I still do, and um, now. My my job is trying to win a race there, and it's freaking impossible, man. Like we've run second a couple times, and like I just can't get it. I can't get a win there. But uh, we're gonna run in the uh, the two year old stakes on the eleventh, so hopefully we can get lucky and, and get a win there. There you go. Well, that leads me into my next question because you also own and breed thoroughbreds under CJ Thoroughbreds, and have had a good amount of success. In fact, I remember you were tied for leading owner very briefly, Saratoga, <laughs> for a day or two. Yeah, that was the year. highlight. That was, yeah, that was a huge, I mean, huge deal, man. Um, that's, that's nothing to sneeze at. But listen, so what's what's that journey been like as, as an owner as, and as, as a breeder? Because I know it's in your family, but in terms of you and like a position of, of uh, an executive position, that might be a newer thing. Yeah, it's um, I mean, like, I, like, like you know, my my old man, he dabbled here and there. We, we would have like a mare, you know what I'm saying? And breeder and just run and have some fun. And so I kind of cut my teeth in the in the horseman side of it there. Um, and you know, we got lucky and, and had a nice two year old that we bred and, and he won a stakes at Golden Gate and we sold him for a decent amount of money. And that kind of, you know, got us going really to start spending more money. And, um, so now kind of our focus with our big horses, we, we like to put together little, little groups of partnerships that our close friends, um, are involved in. And it's not, um, uh, it's a it's a way you know to pay my bills for the office, but like we're not charging crazy management fees. We're not marking up purchases. You know what I'm saying? It's more of like these guys that love the game. They don't know a lot about it. They're good friends of ours. They've always you know been interested, and it's a way for them to get involved. And so I mean that's kind of like the big horses, the stakes winners that we usually have are are in those partnerships. But then on the side, kind of we. We breed, um, like we just sold five Texas bred yearlings yesterday, um, did pretty good, sold one for 75,000, um, you know, and so that's kind of our way to uh, support ourselves right now, because like I said, we're not making any money off these partnerships. Um, we're just trying to have fun with those. But that's like, you know, those are the horses you see, uh, the big horses are, are in these partnerships. And so it's but it's been, it's tough, man. It's it's so up and down. It's It's, I mean, we all know it's up and down, but like when you're looking at the numbers constantly and you're just like, man, we haven't won a race in a month, like, and you know, but then in the next month we'll probably win three or four, you know? And it's just, when it seems hopeless, you just got to keep, keep grinding and keep digging away and, and good things will come, you know? And it's, it's also tough because you got to do what's right by the horse, man. And, and, uh, you know, it's, um, it's a really, really frustrating part of the game because these things try to kill themselves every single day. And I'm telling you every day, like something new pops up with one of our horses. I'm like, I've never even heard of that. I mean, right. we had, we had a Philly have a bad reaction to a vaccine and she like, you know, it was like falling over and stuff. It's like, what, where, where, you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, just something new all the time. And so it'll, it'll test you, man. It really will. Um, but, but I love it. I mean, I get, you know, I get to go to, 
racetracks and and uh you know sale time here coming up at keeneland it's like the it's like the nfl draft you know what i'm saying you're trying to find that diamond in the rough and and uh when it works out there's no better feeling man for sure well and i, I i'm always curious about this the people who have handicapping back backgrounds who manage stables how much of that factors in not just in terms of spotting horses but like you were saying coming up at the sales like your knowledge of pedigrees and how to analyze that how much does that go into your operations yeah well so pedigree wise that's one thing i've really been trying to focus on um because i think i've I've gotten pretty good look i'm not a professional bloodstock agent but i'm good enough to tell you you know what i'm saying eh, this horse is a rat this is gonna you know this is something nice but with pedigrees it's like you know you're handicapping you're looking at maybe like a tomlinson rating or whatever well everyone you know or everyone knows into mischiefs can run on the slop and blah, you know that kind of stuff like but with pedigrees the the Knicks and the inbreeding and the you know oh man this female family loves this duplication blah blah like that stuff is insane and I have a good friend who helps me kind of I mean it is I I just these pedigree guys are are nuts and I know more than the average Joe about pedigrees but like I mean it's it's crazy and so and it's not really something you can just pick up a book and read right because there's also so many different theories and methods on breeding and all that kind of stuff and um you know one guy will go against what another guy says and but they both had success you know so that's um and especially like with our breeding we don't have the budget to go after these commercial sires right i i I don't have good enough mares to send into mischief and, and and uncle mo right so i'm trying to find value um i'm trying to find you know thing and and we also will breed to race. We, we, if it's too nice for us, we'll sell it. But you know what I'm saying. So it's it's kind of a different level. Um, and but that's that's one of the things that people don't. I don't. I think a lot of people don't really understand is the pedigree part of it. Um, yeah. And it's very intimidating, and it's and it's very tough to learn. Um, but yeah, it's it's. And I'm I'm a student for life too. You know what I'm saying. So I I find myself in my office you know, getting just going down wormholes of, of reading articles on, you know, TDN and stuff and, and, and looking at different other people's methods. You know, I read that one on, uh, Mark Johnson's, uh, how he buys horses from the sales over in England. You know what I'm saying? And that's, that's something like we've talked about this year. Let's maybe we need to, you know, take an approach like that where, you know, he's talking about how he can, he can find faults in, in vet reports and stuff. And, you know, cause I'll tell you, man, like, Everyone wants a clean vet report, obviously, but was it was it raised in bubble wrap? You know, yeah. is it? I mean, if you if you raise a horse like a horse, it's probably going to be more sturdy. You know, yep. <laughs> and he's yeah. like, I find stuff I can live with. You know, that's a good thing to me if they if they've got a ding on their vet report. You know, there's so many different so many yeah. different st- like you can you'll never be perfect at this game. Well, there's so much information, and then there's so much context below that information too. That's what makes it so difficult to digest and analyze is because, like you said, there's so many underlying factors just from even the surface information, which by itself is hard enough to figure out. But I just Mm -hmm. wanted to ask one more handicapping question, too, because, you know, you seem like you're a busy guy. Do you still have time to play the horses? And if so, how do you play? Yeah, so I I do. I I always want to – I mean, I love the action, obviously. We all do, right? And, and And I love supporting tracks and and pumping money in for those purses for horsemen i mean um and so the thing i'll tell you is i don't play as many contests as i used to because i got three kids now it's in in the big contests are always on the weekends when like i'm either if i'm not traveling i want to spend that time at home with my family you know and not be glued in front of a computer playing a 20 race you know tournament and, but I still will advocate for tournaments for people because I think they're great. And, um, but so, and, and i like, now I play a decent amount, but not, um, so much in volume as I do. Like I, like Sunday, I, uh, put together a $30 pick five at Del Mar, uh, live in the last leg to five horses. My payouts are ranging from like 700 to 5,000. I get nosed out. I'm the, the horse paying me five grand gets nosed out by the horse paying me 700 on a $30 ticket. You know what I'm saying? Like I take little cheap shots like that and just kind of for the action. Um, and that was just a mess around now. If I'm really playing all, all structure properly and you know, the, the, the Twitter ticket police won't be so angry with me, but I, I just don't have time to anymore, you know, cause that takes, 
more time if you properly want to play, right? I mean, we all, you know, I think we all understand waiting and, and pressing tickets and that kind of stuff. But now I just kind of play cavemans. And depending on how much time I spent on the on the um, sequence, you know, is how big I'll play it. Like Delmore, I'll be honest, the other night I spent 15 minutes putting, you know, putting my pick five together and I played a $30 pick five and I played it perfect. I got lucky. I still made 700 bucks, but the five grand would have been nice. But uh, but no, I look I look for takeout. Um, and again, I'm not playing every race. You know, I'm not playing tries and I'm not trying to sit there. I, I'm trying to put one ticket in and have action for a while. You yeah. know, now when I'm at the track, that's a totally different story. Um, you know, other th- if I'm not, if it's not a real social day, you know, like Whitney day at Saratoga, I made like one bet and it was, uh, it was golden pal over the motion. I hammered the $50 exactly straight. That was the only bet I made all day. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Cause I was just being social with everyone and having yeah. fun. And I wasn't trying to worry about gambling and making money. Um, but if it's if it's not, you know, then I'll play I'll play every race, you know, but um, it's just I think there's different kinds of players now and I, and I can adapt, you know, I'm, I'm kind of I can have fun and just mess around, you know, maybe having a beer with the boys on a Friday night at the bar and like popping on my account and saying, hey, guys, you want to throw something in, you know, that kind of thing or or I can get serious about it. But um, but yeah, I mean, takeout matters. Uh, anytime there's a carryover free money in the pool, I'll play, you know. And it just it just kind of depends how much time I have to put in, you know, my budget. I mean, I, I'm not I'm not going to just throw away money just to you know have fun and and try and hit you know I'm not going to play a hundred and fifty dollar pick five just to you know yeah so you know that's that's definitely a, a kind of line in the sand you have to draw in terms of investing real money. Like, did I go? Did I dive deep enough into this sequence that it, it warrants investing this kind of money? And I think that's this kind of an a, a everlasting struggle for the horse player. And you're so right, like. I love playing socially with people yeah. like I don't go to the track all that much that often, but I was, I was uh, at Saratoga a couple of weeks ago and I was with our associate producer, Katie, and we put in a ticket, pick five ticket, had action all day, cash at the end of the day, split the money. Like that is so much yeah. fun. And that's the kind of stuff that you want to bring people to the track to experience, you know, and it's, you said you have some, some new, some newish to the game partners. Like, is that, is that something that you try to bring them along with too? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, when we're there at the track, um, I can remember, uh, breeders cup at Keeneland. Um, we ran a Philly and we had some partners there and, um, they, you know, they didn't, they didn't know a whole lot about the betting side, you know, for sure. And so, and one of them happened to be a, uh, a pro hockey player and he was with me, um, uh, not Eric Johnson, but a buddy of his, Ben Bishop, the goalie yeah. for the stars. And so oh, he yeah. was with me, he's just had a surgery and his, walking around i mean that dude's like six seven he's on crutches yeah, you know, he could, I you couldn't miss him i remember when okay. he played against them with tampa in the, in yep. the East conference finals yeah. yeah so so he uh his his dad's a partner of ours and the, the great family and uh he came to the breeders cup and he him and his brother had no idea what they were doing so i you know i kind of showed him the ropes and then you know let them fly on their own a little bit but they had a blast doing it man i mean even though we didn't we didn't run that well and and uh they still, it was, it was the experience. It was all that, but still those guys, I mean, you know, they could, they could obviously afford to lose however much they wanted, but they still, you know, they made some money and, and didn't get crushed and, and still enjoyed the day though. So yeah, I definitely try and hold their hand and on, you know, some of that stuff and explain, I mean, as we all know, looking at a form for the first time is, you know, like reading hieroglyphics. Nice. Um, so I kind of just try to point out the main things to them and, uh, you know, take, you know, whatever you think about buyers, it is what it is. But like, you know, they're right there on the form. It's like, look, man, this kind of an algorithm that just tells you their performance, you know, like use these to start off with. And then we can talk about thoroughgraph and all that kind of stuff. So, but yeah, yeah, I I definitely, definitely enjoy teaching. Um, And, and I mean, again, it's the only way we're going to really grow the game is if we, if we get these, these new people, um, you know, and I'm not trying to turn them into degenerate gamblers, but like, you know, let's let's have some fun and, and learn and, and kind of try and hit some tickets and have fun. Yeah, and feel comfortable enough in your own ability to read the form. Like that takes a while, but once yeah. you get that, like you're you're good. You've created a fan for life. I'd ask you about this about Texas racing because you're a Texas guy, obviously. Um, you know, you might have to be politically correct about this. I'm yeah. not sure. Um, you know, we have this battle right now with Heisa and and the Texas Racing Commission. And there's like a resulting simulcasting blackout. And there's obviously repercussions from that. It's yeah. already it's already been said that maybe the Houston Racing Festival won't 
happen next year in Sam Houston. You know, you don't have to be too specific if you can't, but like what just overall, what are your thoughts about that and its likelihood to get resolved? Yeah, and I'm glad you said Houston Racing Festival might get canceled because I think one of the things, some of those articles we read, they looked like it was doom and gloom and it's done. And people were asking me, oh my God, Texas Racing's dead. No, that that's if we can't get this sorted out with Tyson. Yep. That is a worst case scenario. And I, I, I don't think those articles did a good job of explaining that. I, yeah. I mean, I, personally, I would have let off with, you know, if this can't get resolved, here's what's going to happen. Right. So I, I look, it's, it's, uh, it's Texas. We don't like the federal government coming in and telling us what to do. Right. I mean, it's, it is what it is. I'm not, but from what I've heard and I'm, I, I got to, there is enough high profile owners in Texas who have the ear of of the governor and this is this should get resolved before Sam Houston. That's we got, you know, three months, right? I, I I'm confident that it will get resolved. Um I don't know if the governor, you know, because the racing commission she, the executive director, you know, kind of did what she needed to do and went to her boss in Austin and you know, she, I mean, she can't agree to this without the powers that be saying, all right, let's go. And so I think there was probably some miscommunications, probably some misunderstanding. And look, I'm not saying uh, Heisa is perfect. I think there's lots of things that, you know, worry me about it. But I think that everyone is willing to kind of work together and get this figured out. I, we definitely need some sort of national oversight. I think we can all agree with that. But um I, I, like I said, I, I'm confident that's going to get figured out. I wouldn't have just, you know, I, and I think the sale yesterday, honestly, shows that everyone else is, uh, the sale was up. Um, we sold, you know, in Texas, you got to breed every other year to Texas stallions. So we sold like some braidsters, my golden songs and too much blings. And we only sold five and we did better than we did last year selling eight that were sired by Kentucky sires. Wow. Now I think we honestly had better physicals. Uh, this year. Um, but you know, the, the strength of the sale was, was off the charts. And so I think everyone kind of understands that this is going to get taken care of. I know, I know some pin hookers texted me and were asking me like, dude, do I even come to Texas? Like I got to make money. Like I'm not going to buy a Texas bread and pin hook it. If you know, you guys aren't even running for, you know, if you're running for peanuts next year. And I, I just said, I told him exactly what I told you. I, th I think it's going to get sorted out. Uh, I'm confident it will. It, the end of the Lone Star meet, it it was uh it was unfortunate what happened um and and you know Lone Star was good enough they still paid out all their purses they they had a little bit of an overpayment but they'll make that up uh in simulcast because we can simul still bet you know on Saratoga um and that kind of stuff um but luckily there's no thoroughbred racing in Texas right now so we're not losing out on sending out our signal right now yeah. um so that simulcast in is huge around here because we don't have ADWs and Lone Star Park is the only place to bet if uh, in, uh, you know, there's 9 million people in the DFW Metroplex. Like, that's the only place you can bet. So their their handle, you know, their simulcast handle is pretty big. And so they're they're confident they can make that money up. But again, I, I mean, it, it sucks. It really does. I love this place. I want to see racing be at Lone Star what it was in the, in the you know, late 90s and early 2000s. I mean, that was you know, some of the best racing in the country. And so, I mean, we're dedicated to, to help it out. And and my pops is on the board of the Texas Thoroughbred Association. So I know they're doing everything they can um, to make sure that, you know, this works out because yeah, obviously we can't, I mean, it, it's nice down here because if we have, if we buy a decent horse that can't cut it, you know, New York, Kentucky, Florida, we can bring them here and run for decent money. You know what yeah. I'm saying? And, um, that way we don't have to just drop them up there and worry about getting them claimed or whatever. If they, you know, if they've got a pedigree or anything like that um, and we can still make it work down here. So. Yeah. That's the thing too, is there's, there was a lot of positive news in Texas racing with all the, the purse money and the escrow account and all that stuff that's been approved by the legislature. This would be such an own goal. I feel like yeah. if this dragged on and it would, it, this, it doesn't hurt anybody but Texas racing. So yeah, like you said, hopefully they get that sorted out. Let's talk sports. You're a big Dallas sports fan. Go ahead. Tell me why this is the year the Cowboys stop being a disappointment because I know as a Cowboys fan, it's deep down in there somewhere. Oh God. It no, it's not the year. It's <laughs> look, man, I'm a, I'm the realest Cowboys fan you'll ever meet in your life. All right, all right, all right. Like I I understand the um 
a lot of Cowboys fans are completely clueless in every year this year, this year. I mean, look, we just lost our best O-lineman. Like, I mean, he's out for a couple months. Like, I, I have, after years and years and years of disappointment, I have finally kind of, like, tailored my expectations. Look, I love the Cowboys. I will watch every game. But I'm not it, – it's not going to ruin my day anymore, man. I can't – like, I'm getting too old. You know what I'm saying? Like, back in the day, you lose a big game, and it's like – Yeah. Your day is ruined, and it's like, I just can't – I've been disappointed so much by them. I've, I've curtailed my expectations to where, like, they can't hurt me anymore. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm like a broken soul in a relationship. I've been – dumped by so many girls i can't love again you know that kind of thing and so i mean look they they uh the offense obviously i mean we'll have the defense man the defense last year i mean look we've got i've always i've been saying for years let's work on that defense the secondary please come on and now look we got a cornerback who's unbelievable you know what i'm saying um so i mean but we lost all world yeah yeah i mean we did lose some big names on that d-line but um I think I, our division's pretty bad too. Yeah. So I think I mean, <laughs> look, all you got to do is make it to the get the playoffs, right? And then who knows? Um, so I mean, I think I think obviously we we got a great shot to win the division, but um, after that, man, I don't know. It's it's just, I, it's so hard to have, and everyone wants to, you know, eh, McCarthy will never be good enough for here, even though it's like the guys won a Super Bowl. He knows what it takes. That was always our problem. Like Jason Garrett had no clue what to do in in you know, tough situations like that, clutch situations. I, I actually have faith in McCarthy. Um, it's, it's, he is not as predictable as Jason Garrett was. Like, literally, I would sit there and watch games and be like, I know what they're going to do right here. You know, here's third and five, and we're going to run the ball in a, in a, <laughs> we're going to be in the shotgun and we're going to run a draw to Zeke on third and five. We're going to get three yards and then punt, guaranteed. Sure yeah. enough, that's what would happen. You know, I think that's just, that, that drives people crazy about McCarthy is like the, the timeout stuff. Because yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. You know, like people watch on TV and they're like, I could get that right. Forget the fact that they couldn't get the 50 other things he has to think about right. But the timeout stuff, the time management. That was know? that was inexcusable. I, I agree there. But, I mean, the guy's been a head coach for how long? Has that always been an issue? I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I didn't watch, like, every Packers game when he was, you yeah. know, tearing it up there. But, like, was that kind of like a, you know, just maybe a – lapse in judgment like one you know if now if he continues to do it that's another thing but i'll i'll i i think i don't know man that that was a tough one to swallow but um again i i think his experience and um all that makes up for it yo so i'm a jet fan so i got no place to talk yeah <laughs> i'm able to make fun of people like i think you know that that Paul and Oates lyric on Rich Girl. He's like, "It's so easy to hurt others when you can't feel pain." That's me. Yes, but I'll make exactly fun of it because I can't feel pain anymore as a Jet fan. Well, I mean, dude, we were good in the '90s, and like it was. Yeah. I was, I was, I just moved to Texas. I was always a Cowboys fan, obviously, because I, I lived in like Oklahoma, and you know everyone's Cowboys fans. But like, I didn't know what it meant to be a fan then, right? And so when I turned to like 18, 19, you know, twenty, and it's like that crazy fandom. You know, we were we were dealing with like Quincy Carter and like those like I mean just brutal, like absolutely terrible. And then Romo comes along and it's like, and look, I'll, I'm the biggest Romo defender you'll ever meet. Like, don't ever say anything bad about the no, guy. The I guy loved him. The guy deserved so much more than he got, and yeah. because of an incompetent owner slash GM, he did not get what he should have, what he deserved. Uh, that 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 guy was good enough to win a Super Bowl, and. In my eyes, if he had a team around him, he would become he would be immediately in the conversation as an all time great. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I felt so bad for that guy. He was so much fun to watch too. Well, it's so funny because like the the I used to hate the Cowboys because, you know, I grew up watching them be great in the mid nineties and they were they were the evil empire. And that lasted for a while. And now I think I've come all the way back around where I feel bad enough for the Cowboys that I want them to do well. I want them to make a deep run this year in the playoffs. And the NFC is up for grabs, too, I think, for the most part, other than the Rams. But the thing that makes him, them still hateable is Jerry. You know, he it's just – its there's nothing like when the Cowboys screw up something in a big way and then they cut to him in the owner's box and he's just, like, fuming. Like, that is – that hook it to my veins, you know? He, he, I know, and I can understand that, too, as someone who's not a Cowboys fan. Like, he's – I, I've said it for years, like, we are not going to be relevant until he removes himself. And I think he started doing that a little bit. Um, otherwise, we would have 
drafted Johnny Manziel or whatever it was, you know, that year, like he was apparently going up with the card and they were like, no, <laughs> yeah. Like, so I think there's hope there, but he is an embarrassment, man. And, and I, I, uh, I know he bought the team and did what he did early on, but like, at, at what point do you got to like, look at yourself and be like, look, we haven't been relevant, you know, in 30 years, like, it's time to to step back and and just look I, the new stadium i don't like going to games now like it's this it's a joke like all the away fans the tickets are so expensive all the season ticket holders sell their tickets and just keep them for like other, certain games and playoffs so the away fans mob this place cuz they're like we got to see the new stadium like it's like a you know it's a tourist event now and so there's like now there's a hundred thousand people there, so it's still loud, but it's not like the old stadium. You're just in this little toilet bowl, you know what I'm saying? Like just nasty, grimy. Real fans can afford to sit down in in close to the field. Now all the real fans are up top in the 300s, and it's like, I mean, I've sat up there before for a college game. Like, you know, I didn't care because I was in college and watching my team, but it's like, you know, everyone's that big, and you have no idea what's, and you're watching this stupid giant screen and it's just it's not the same man like artwork everywhere marble floors like dude give me like concrete and you know beer spilled everywhere and that kind of stuff that's the same yo and i'm wearing the mets jersey right now the new york we knocked down both stadiums around the same time city field is a big improvement on shea stadium the new yankee stadium is not nearly as good as the old yankee stadium because for the same way i think they tried to build like a monument and like a, a museum or some shit, and not like a not a stadium, not a not a ballpark, you know. Exactly. We just did it for the Rangers. We just built a new stadium, and and dude, the the ballpark in Arlington was like one of America's best ballparks. I feel like now it's 110 degrees in the summer. I get it. Like no one wants to come play here. I understand, but they were like, well, it costs more to put a roof on than to build a new stadium. Look, I'm no engineer, but how the hell is it? more expensive to put a roof on a stadium than to build a, right. a whole new one. Right. But now we've got this beautiful cathedral that actually looked like a baseball sitting there empty, just having concerts every once in a while in this stupid, you know, uh, retractable roof, gaudy looking thing right next to Jerry world too, by the way, like right there, you know, and it's just like, I mean, give me the old metal bleachers of Arlington stadium back in the day. Like that's when I, I we would drive down from Oklahoma to watch Nolan Ryan pitch. You know what I'm saying? This nasty bleachered stadium that looks like they could just take it down if they wanted to, you know, but then they built the ballpark and it was beautiful. And then it's now, I think they built it in like 95 and it's already done. And they just built it's, I haven't been to a game in the new stadium. That's I, I, ref, I mean, we suck, but still like I, I won't go. That's so funny what you say about how's the roof more expensive than the stadium? Like, I guess the roof comes free if you built a new stadium. Yeah, it's yeah, I know. But, like, it just it makes no sense to me. And, again, I'm not an engineer, an architect, but, man, like, I don't know. So, yeah, I mean, but I'm one of those people, if you see me at the track, I'm down in the apron. I'm not, I'm not like, we ran at Saratoga when I was there, uh, Whitney Day. Dude, I wasn't wearing a coat. I wasn't going in the clubhouse. Like, I wasn't, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I'd rather be there with, with uh, you know, all my buddies betting and you know under the paddock bar or wherever and rather be there than a box yeah. like stuffy how and, fun is the paddock bar by the way the new paddock bar was so much fun it was actually really fun. cool i mean there was you know the tent back in the day is what it is but like that paddock bar was pretty nice oh. i didn't go upstairs i mean i'm not paying that no no no, no. Up there but, but you just lean out over but, the rail and see the horses come by uh i was there all day Heaven. like right over the rail yeah. just watch and i could look at these horses and see which ones look good and stuff and and uh no it was it was a lot of fun. I, I really dig that. I don't know what's going on with it now. There's rumors about some like structural problems or something I'm hearing. Yeah. So I don't know, but I, I don't, you know, and I didn't see any horses get spooked by it. So, yeah, um, no, no. cause I know a lot of people were complaining when they debuted it. They're like, Oh, this is not a good idea. People in racing just love to complain. That's an eternal, eternal truism in the sport. They just like to complain, especially on Twitter. But yeah, I'm with you. Like the new Meadowlands, like it's so much more fun to, tailgate and pregame outside than it is to go into that stadium it's hideous yeah. <laughs> i want to ask you real quick about the mavs um because i want to get to, to our hip-hop conversation um are you a mavs fan first of all i am a that's like my team we were season ticket holders for years and years and years and then when kind of all the crazy stuff started going on right before luca with the sexual harassment stuff and all that remember that we we were like we're done. We're not. I mean, because, dude, they won the championship and then the team blows up and it's like, what are we doing? You know what I'm saying? Like, and we 
canceled our our season tickets and then luca comes along and it's yeah. like damn it might have to buy oh, yeah. him back again yeah no okay so let's uh, talk about it because they had a great year they went to the western conference finals i loved loved seeing them kick the the teeth in of chris paul and the Suns. that, that made me so happy um but so now they lost jalen brunson they had to pay luca this like semi max deal what's your overall feeling on the the near future of the mavs um so Obviously, we got JaVale McGee. I think I think uh, some rim protection was much needed. Um, and then uh, I'm losing my mind. What's the guy that we got from Houston? Um, the uh, the power forward slash center. Oh. Yes, thank you. Oh, it Christian? I think. Yeah, I think yeah. he will be. Um, I think he'll be a big piece of this. I love Jalen Brunson. Obviously, like we, you know, he was. No one had any hope for him, really. I mean, you know, I know his accolades in college were unbelievable, but everyone said that's not going to translate to the NBA, right? And so. Uh, I'm happy for him getting paid. Um, I'm not like gutted that we lost him. Um, I think, you know, we're going to have Tim Hardaway Jr. back now, which, you know, he is what he is. We all know that. Um, we didn't have him last year. Um, I think I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm pretty pumped. I really am. And I'm, and I'm usually a pessimist when it comes to a lot of this kind of stuff, to be honest with you. Uh, Dinwiddie was a huge surprise last year. We get him and I'm like, Wait, well, first off, I mean, KP, like, you got to go, dude. Like, you know what I'm saying? We were paying him way too much money. I'm glad. But it was like, what did we get back for him? You know, and I'm like, didn't we really? Because I hear all these problems in the locker room and all that, this and that. And, like, he was huge, man. Um, yeah. I liked him a lot. Um, you know, JaVale McGee is not the JaVale McGee he used to be, but the guy is still pretty useful. Um, you know, he still plays with an edge. He's got a chip on his shoulder. You know, he'll he'll be kind of some – because we've always kind of been a soft team. You know what I'm saying? Even through the dark days. Um, Deshaun Stevenson was like the key to winning that championship. Yeah. We had someone that would punch you right back in your mouth yeah, yeah. when you came. You know what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. um, I think we're kind of getting that back. We're, um, now it's tough when you go to the Western Conference Finals. You know what I'm saying? And then um, it, there's a lot to live up to. Uh, but the way – I'll be honest, man – the way we handled the Suns, I was I wasn't really surprised. I I kind of saw that with the matchup with, you know, um, I actually I don't know if you remember this, but it was two game sevens, the Suns and the Stars, back to like back to back games, right? Matt, I buddies and I put in a parlay: Mavs to win straight up, Stars to win straight up, and it was to make some decent money. And I was feeling like really confident about that game. Actually, yeah. now did I ever think we'd be up like forty at halftime? No way. It's crazy. Um, so, and then like, then the stars who also completely overachieved, like that stars team was terrible last year. Like we snuck into the playoffs two, two or three games before the end of the season. You know what I mean? It was back and forth. Um, and so, you know, Calgary, who was, you know, one of the best teams in the, in the West. Um, anyways, that game goes to overtime. My buddies don't bet much, you know, we're like sitting there like, Oh my God, we got a legit shot to make some money here. And then stars losing overtime. But, but no, I, I, back to the Mavs, I, I really wasn't that surprised in that. Now, I knew we had no shot versus the, uh, <laughs> versus Golden State. Like, yeah, I mean, I, that was just a tough one. You can't, that team, so good. And they're not even what they used to be. And they're still, you know what I'm saying? I mean, when we knocked out the Suns, that kind of gave, opened the door for them. I think the Suns were probably the only team that matched up, you know, and probably could have beaten them if they wanted to. But, yeah. but yeah. Yeah, I mean that was I remember that that night too because that was the Rangers Penguins game seven and I get over to my boy's house to watch the third period and he goes the Mavs are up forty like the, <laughs> the Mavs are up forty points I yeah got, I got to check this out I mean that was that was a lot a lot of, lot of uh, Schadenfreude because the Suns were such a hateable team to me you know that was, absolutely like yeah. in the in the way they acted in their wins it. it like you would have thought that they were just going to sweep us. Like they were just so cocky. And it was like, you guys better slow down just a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Like I, and, and Luca just, I mean, people will try to dog him. I don't know how you can, man. That kid is something special. It, it, he, I look, I hate him complaining. He needs to shut his mouth and just earn his stripes and, and then he can complain. You know what I'm saying? But like, he's complaining like he's like Dirk, you know, 15th year in the league, like he, yeah. you, you got to earn those. It's a like, European thing. I think it's a mainly European thing. And I loved his quote though. Like everybody, everybody talks tough when they're up. And that was like yeah. one of those great mm -hmm. quotes, like, you know, portending quotes that then they come oh, yeah. and beat them in game six and game seven. All right. Yep. 
let's do this before we get out of here. I promise you we do this because apparently Barry Spears and now me are the only other hip hop heads you know in racing, which doesn't sound far fetched, by the way. It's, it's definitely believable. Yeah. Uh, so let's let's and this is where eighty percent of racing is going to click off right now. But let's do it anyway, top five rappers all time, dead or alive. Who you got, man? I don't know. I know. I know. We got to go. But I'm. I'm such like I grew up on you know dirty South stuff. But now I was living in a bubble. And then I when I went out to Arizona, I had good friends from the East Coast and West Coast. And so that's when I kind of really early two thousands got enlightened. Um, and I I really like the groups and collabs. Like I can't really sit here look. Like obviously Jay Z Nas like yes I and I love that music right I mean one two gotta be and then you go kind of Tupac Biggie I I personally do but but um I I just love like messages and and like Black Star Talib Kweli Most Def like that really um that album like shaped me the Reflection Eternal album with Kweli like and 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 really got me loving like hip hop that you you got to think about, you know what I'm saying? And, um, and through that, you know, that's when I heard about Kanye cause he was producing and Kanye's first two albums are like some of the greatest things ever, but now he's just absolutely terrible. And I'm sorry if I'm offending anyone, but like, I, I still, he's so bad, but I mean that, that, you know, so that early two thousands era, real late nineties. Um, I mean, MF doom, like rest in peace. Like I, I can't really name just a top five, but like, so I kind of, I break it out into, you know, uh, regions and that kind of stuff. But I, I like a lot of like West coast, like hieroglyphics and living legends. And, and then, you know, even the Midwest atmosphere POS, like just, um, but I don't know, man, I, I, I can't just go, here's my five, four, three, two, right, one. Right. it's, it's, it's real tough. Um, because I can tell you like, Hey, this album definitely, you know, like, all right, best album my i'll go album how's that so reflection eternal probably is my favorite album of all time um quality and dj high tech and then probably like reasonable doubt like reasonable doubt was just front like they don't make front to back like that anymore um and then probably go black star which i actually named the constitution philly redefinition out of uh from one of those songs um and then probably like oh man Kanye's first album and then maybe you know 36 Chambers something like that uh, hey, you're all over the place I'm, you know, listen I'm with you and I'm so glad you brought up Talib and, and Most Def because Talib actually I didn't go with him but he went to my high school in Brooklyn, Brooklyn. Really? yeah and and Most is a guy who's from Fort Greene which I spent a lot of time in so I'm a huge huge Black Star guy, and I love that album, Reflection Eternal. I agree with that. Was like that was like one of the first CDs I bought, like an actual yeah. physical CD, rap CD that I bought. So that's up there too. Like you said, College Dropout, one of the most important albums in my life. I don't know if you've seen the Kanye yeah. documentary, but it's like I haven't watched it yet. I you should to. watch it, or at least the first part. Like the lad, the end is like depressing because it's like Kanye as he is now. Yeah, but the part is basically like a shot for shot retelling of him making College Dropout, which is incredible. Really? to watch and he's going into these, these studios and into these record company buildings and like dying for people to take him seriously and it's just yeah. so fun to watch in retrospect and they just they're blowing him off it's it's absolutely perfect uh reasonable doubt like you said blueprint too blueprint yeah i blueprint totally missed that came one out yeah. on september 11th and it was like it was banging for months after that when nothing yeah. was really going on there were you know there was nothing no clubs open or any of that stuff so that's up there too. For me, uh, I was a big 50 guy, so Get Rich or Die Trying is <laughs> okay. definitely up there. Definitely top five albums for me because I had been a 50 fan for a while, unless his mixtape stuff. And mm -hmm. once he finally got signed to a major label okay. contract and put that album out, I knew he was going to have a ton of heat. And he did. Yeah, being from the city, you I, you know about these guys before they come up, right? Like, all I heard uh, from 50 was, yeah, some Eminem stuff. And then, well, and we, we didn't even talk about him because his first two albums, like, shaped my high school. But um, 50, like, for, you know, all I think of him is in the club and, you know, that. I mean, you know, the guy's got talent, but he just wasn't. Being from where I'm from, it's a little different. You know what I'm saying? No, for me, it was like, like I, had he, bought, I had bought his mixtapes forever and until he got signed, it felt like. Sure. You know? Sure. And that's how like we were down here with like Chameleon Air and, and Lil Flip and that kind of stuff, you know, but then you kind of 
once you mature and grow up, you're like, man, I don't, I don't really want to just listen to, you know, these guys talking about like big rims on their cars and sipping lean and that kind of stuff. Like I want some intellectual well, stuff. To what make was so me... great about Kanye too, to me, it's yeah. like he made, cause hip hop has so much br- bravado, like necessary yeah. bravado, but also over the top where everybody has to fit this mold of this like alpha male gun shooting, drug selling pimp, you know, yeah. Kanye broke that mold. He said, I'm a thoughtful yeah. guy. I'm insecure, but I love music. And this is what I'm saying. You know, that's that was yeah. so huge. And he was just producing at the time. Like I, I've got the, the, the poster for Quali's, uh quality and it's like, it's Pharaoh Monch and, and so and so. And then at the very bottom little small it says Kanye West. Like I got another frame on my wall, actually. You know what I'm saying? It's like, man, just and then, you know, he obviously the blueprint did a bunch on that. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. Now I just I don't listen to anything new at all. It's it's sad. I mean, even some of these guys put out stuff and I'm like, I can't listen to this. What um, about like the big guys, the big newish guys like Drake and Kendrick and J. Cole? Like I can't do it, man. No? I can't I, I I it um so I feel like uh, a lot in it, and it kind of started with Lil Wayne. Like, and look, I used to, I was listening to Lil Wayne when he was 15 or whatever, you know, on mixtapes and stuff down here, like yeah. the Master P, you know, bringing him up and and all that. And like, then he just starts mumbling and making up words, and and I mean, it was all right, but it was just, it was like he was trying too hard, or or maybe he wasn't trying enough. I don't really know, but it, it I, it was tough. And and Drake. I mean, I see him start off on a Disney TV show. Now he wants to act gangster. Like, you know, and like, I'm, it's just, it's, I don't know. Like literally the new stuff, like I can, I can get into some Migos here. Okay, CJ, I can talk to you all day and all night, but I think God is interrupting us for our bad hip hop opinions and has kicked you off a couple of times. So we got to wrap this up, but thank you so much for the time. And I, you know, I, I said this before, but I, I really have such respect for you and what you did Kentucky Downs and your, your place in the industry. It's been great to talk to you, my man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, the, uh, you know, I think you guys have done a great job with the TDN. Look, my dad, you know, he's a, uh, he's a, uh, you know, upper 60s and he doesn't really listen to podcasts and stuff, but he started getting into them and literally all the time he's like, have you listened to the writer's room yet this week? Have you listened to the writer's room? And I'm like, how are you listening to this <laughs> stuff before I am? So big fan of yours, what you're doing at the TDN as well. And I and I appreciate you having me on anytime you want to talk, you know, horses, hip hop, let's go. Absolutely, man. Let's keep in touch. Appreciate the time. All right, buddy. Welcome back to my Breeders' Cup sponsored handicapping segment here on Better Things with Joe Bianca. We've done two of these so far. First one couldn't have gone much better. I picked the winner of the Haskell Cyberknife at almost eight to one, made about $558 profit. Unfortunately, last time for the Whitney, my horse scratched. American Revolution scratched the day of the race. So we had no action in there. So why not just go a little bit harder this time around? This Saturday, we have two televised Breeders' Cup Challenge qualifiers. Saturday, September 3rd on NBC and Peacock from 4.30 to 6 o'clock. You can watch the Jockey Club Gold Cup and the Flower Bowl Stakes from Saratoga. The Jockey Club Gold Cup is, of course, a qualifier for the $6 million Breeders' Cup Classic, the richest race in North America. And the Flower Bowl is a qualifier for the Grade 1 Philly and Mayor, Breeders' Cup Philly and Mayor Turf, which is a $2 million race. Let's start with the Jockey Club Gold Cup. Todd Pletcher has four of the eight horses, one of which I got burned by last time with the late scratch of American Revolution. And unfortunately, he'll probably be half the price Saturday that he would have been in the Whitney. Probably close to five to two second choice behind Olympiad at seven to five or eight to five. So my strategy within the race is to try to beat Olympiad in the first two slots. So I'm going to use five American Revolution, six first captain and eight dynamic one as the three horses who I think will be best at a mile and a quarter, which is the Jackie Cup Gold Cup distance. Been run at Belmont historically. Breaks my heart a little bit as a kid who grew up going to Belmont to see it at Saratoga, but it's obviously still a terrific grade one race. Olympia is the horse to beat, and I think he might get his typical perfect outside stalking trip. He drew the two posts, speedy taxes to his inside, but he simply was not good in the Whitney and did not have a visible, visible excuse. And I think it's honestly just foolish in general to just assume horses are going to bounce back to their top race when they're short prices, especially like Olympiad when they're trying something new for the first time. He's going 10 furlongs for the first time. So Dynamic 1 and First Captain were a nose apart in the mile and a quarter suburban stakes at Belmont. 
The race only got a 98 fire, but watching the replay and looking at the race's internal fractions, you'll see how big each of them ran. They both got stuck behind a slow pace and had to move early and wide, and they came home in 23.78, which is a very, very strong final split for a 10 furlong race. Overall, they got their last six furlongs in a 111 and change. Not an easy thing to do considering the distance and considering their ground loss and their pace disadvantage. And that's not that's not a fluke. Before the Suburban, Dynamic One came home in 36.03, despite a wide run in the blame stakes. First captain came home in well under 18 seconds for his final 316s in the Pimlico Special, again, with a wide trip. So if either of those two can save ground Saturday and get at least a modestly competitive pace up front, I think they'll be finishing fastest of all in a tiring Saratoga stretch. So the play in the Jockey Club Gold Cup is a $20 exacta box, five, six, eight for a total of $120. The grade two flower ball, which is also heartbreaking to me because historically it's been a grade one race and a real marquee race for Philly and Mare Turfers. It's been downgraded to a grade two this year, but it is, like I said, a winning your in qualifier for the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Turf. It's a less interesting betting race because there's a huge heavy favorite that I have no interest in trying to beat in Warlike Goddess. She is clearly the leader of this division. She was a close third in the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Turf last year. She won the Flower Bowl last year. She's just a win machine. She's back to defend her title instead of trying males and a grade one in the Sword Dancer last week. And she has just simply proven she's better than these Phillies and Mares over and over again. And other than two Chad Brown horses who are going to be overbet because it's Chad, there really are no new shooters to speak of to get excited about. So instead of playing within the race, I'm going to single number four, Warlike Goddess, who's just a machine in the pick five. And it has some good, there are some good sized fields in the sequence, 15% takeout, reliable looking sing, single. That's what I look for when I want to play pick fives and multi-race bets. That clearly is the move to me for, for me. So here's what the ticket looks like. The first leg is the ninth race. I'm going to spread in here. It's a turf allowance optional claimer with a lot of potential winners, I think. I'm going to use the two, three, four, seven, nine, and ten. The second leg is the Flower Bowl, singling number four, Warlike Goddess. The third leg is the Jockey Club Gold Cup. I'm going to use Olympiad, even though I'm trying to beat him within the race. I'm not going to get knocked out of the pick five when a seven to five or eight to five horse wins. It just doesn't make any sense. So I'm going to use two Olympiad, five American Revolution, six first captain and dynamic one. In the 12th race, I'm going to spread as well. I'm going to use three, four, five, six, seven, eight and ten. And then the fifth leg, which is the 13th race, or yeah, the 13th race, which is a turf sprint. I'm only going to go too deep. I'm going to use number eight, Eyes of Malibu Moon, and number 11, Quick Power Nap. So we'll put this up on the screen. It's a total of $168 on the ticket. Two, three, four, seven, nine, ten, with four, with two, five, six, eight, with three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten, with eight, eleven. Total of 168, several chances for prices in there to really make this pay. And like I said, a single I trust. That's the ideal sequence. A single you feel like you can rely on and then some races surrounding it where you feel like there might be a little bit of chaos and you can maybe get a double digit horse to pop in there. And like I said, with the takeout at 15%, you really only need one of those horses to make it pay. So in total, we're investing $288 of our $558.45 profit from the Haskell. So no matter what happens, we'll still be playing with house money next week, but hopefully we can build on the profit and keep this thing rolling as we reach the halfway point of our six episode Breeders' Cup partnership and get closer and closer, just over two months away now from the Breeders' Cup World Championships, November 4th and 5th at Keeneland. Good luck if you're following along. Okay, so that's going to do it for this week's edition of Better Things with Joe Bianca. Had a lot of fun talking to CJ Johnson and definitely check out that Kentucky Downs meet. It used to be an afterthought, like I said, of Saratoga and Del Mar. But if you want big fields, low takeout, you love turf racing, you definitely have to get involved. And CJ was such a big part of that meet becoming what it, what it is. So thank you to CJ for joining us. Thank you to the Breeders' Cup for the sponsorship. Hopefully we can make you a little bit of money this Saturday in the Jockey Club Gold Cup and the Flower Bowl. Thank you to my producer, Patty Wolf, as well, and our editor. Anthony LaRocca, Aliyah LaRocca, and Nathan Wilkinson. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next week. We'll be back next week for another Breeders' Cup Challenge handicapping segment and another fascinating guest. Thanks for watching.